show how quickly the HPC goes by. This is our last class of recession. Aww. 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 Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure today to introduce Corey Kennedy and Dr. Thomas Lamb. Both uh, did their undergraduate at the uh, University of Toronto in 2007. Uh, uh, high performance sports clinic was open called Fitz uh, Sports Clinic. And uh, the, the major specialty that they work with is injury prevention and performance enhancement. We work with basketball, volleyball, and alpine skiing. And they've been able to work with athletes at, at the highest level. They've been able to win medals at, at, at junior world championships. And they're here to talk to us today about uh, staying healthy as volleyball players and, and how we can improve our performance by, by getting stronger. Let's welcome Dr. Thomas Lyon. We'd like to say thank you, Jason, for inviting us here to allow us to talk to you guys. You guys are obviously a group of young athletes who are right on the edge of going to that kind of elite level when you're at either post-secondary or, you know, potentially within five years, like at the Olympic Games or Pan-Ams and things like that. So it's a really good opportunity for us to just kind of tell you about what we do and see if, you know, you guys are on the right path. So we're going to talk about injury perform prevention and the athletic performance continuum. So the goals of today's talk are um, to understand how athleticism and injury prevention is a continuum. So on one side, you can be talking about you know trying not to get jumper's knee, trying not to tear your ACL, uh, to avoid ankle sprains, different things like that. And then on the other side, it's the really cool stuff, right? I want to jump higher, I want to be stronger, I want to be faster. But it's not as different as it seems. So even though you might look at them as boring and exciting, or necessary and hopefully an extra. They're kind of all melded together. So understand the importance of movement. So we have, um, we go with M cubed or M3 to kind of describe movement. We'll go further into that later. But it's basically the central tenet of everything we do is, is how you move. So it's not just about how high and how far but how you do it. So um, you can have 10 different people. We can ask you all right now to stand up and do a squat. And even though you're all doing a squat, you won't necessarily all do the same thing. So um, there's certain ways that we should all move and kind of ideal ways for the human body to move. And it may change depending on your um, you know, body length and height, different things like that. And then appreciation on how injuries occur. So sometimes they seem like a freak accident and sometimes they're totally preventable and sometimes you don't know the difference. You know, something that may seem like an accident is very preventable and sometimes it's the other way around. So, you want to share some of the stories? Um, yeah, so we kind of talked about some of the, the major sports that were involved with. So this is kind of like our, our basketball, a little bit of our history. Um, and just uh, last Thursday we had our first uh, player get drafted into the <coughs> 19th overall. Orlando Magic, and we'll kind of explain some of, I'll kind of share a story that I had um, when he was no one, right, with you guys, but no one knew about him. Actually, there's this kind of like this really cool story where um, he actually, I probably shouldn't actually be saying this, but he actually didn't even want to play basketball whatsoever. He was at a camp, and he was actually crying. He brought his mother there, and he actually refused for him to actually leave. And his mother actually thanks um, the coach that actually forced him to stay that entire period um, because you're, you're looking at possibly one of the biggest impact players that are, is gonna hit the, the NBA next year. He was um, undervalued at 19th overall. He's only been playing the game of basketball for six years as well. Next group uh, represents uh, some of our Olympic, um, some, some of our winter sport athletes. And so we've been able to, to work, at, you know, with the bobsled as well. So we had a, a silver medal at last year's games, and we we'll also work with skiers. And then the other group is our beach volleyball group and volleyball group. So okay. So faster, higher, stronger. That's kind of the name of the game whenever you're talking about performance. Um, the guy on the left, I can't remember his name. Jeff Melzer or Melzer or Meslin. He plays at UC Santa Barbara and he's probably 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, I think, but he also jumps around the low 40s, 
which is just incredible. And so this is a picture, obviously, that is, is pretty crazy to see, considering, you know, usually, you guys know, your middles are gonna be your biggest players. And he had his feet almost at the bottom of the net. His middle's not even getting close to him. But um, that's the idea, right? Everyone wants to get as high as they can over the net, because it makes life a whole lot easier to transport points. Uh, the other guy is one of our uh, playing skiers, and this is just kind of a fun photo shoot he did. Um, he's a super athletic guy. Alpine skiers don't get enough credit because they have some of the highest vertical of any of the athletes we work with. They're extremely explosive. So this was, we have a couple times in our gym that we flip around and do different things. But so this is just more of a fun photo shoot, but he actually jumped over it, so it's not a Photoshop situation. So success at the highest level, what is it all about? So there's been a number of people do research on volleyball, as have been, have been on many other sports, and they found that just as we've been talking about, and just as you probably guessed, um, you know, the elite level players all jump way higher than the sort of sub-elite players and then the young players and so forth. So one one big study that just came out recently was uh, in Australia, and they followed um, about 30 guys from sort of like the junior national team in Australia till the senior national team. So it was about a three year period, and then they kind of tracked the changes in their bodies and for all the ones that made it through. And then every one of those guys also had a professional contract in Europe for the winter, indoor. And they found that the biggest sort of um, indicators of the ones who made it were spike jump height, counter movement jump height, and then a couple of strength measurements. So um, their power clean and their squat. So that's the, the kind of, we'll say sexy stuff. That's the, I want to get strong, I want to jump high, and it works, right? So those guys, they all moved, they got professional contracts, moved to the uh, national senior level, and now they're playing the world stage. So we came up with this concept that fits called Flight School. So Flight School was originally a standalone program where you could come in and learn how to jump higher. Um, since then, we've kind of melted it back in with all of our athletes because even if you come in and say, well, I don't play basketball, I don't play volleyball, but you know, I want to get better, the chances are if we make any kid jump higher, he's going to be more explosive than whatever sport you play. So we tried to we merge it back into kind of the program we do with all of our athletes and just put into the right area of development for them. So a couple of the things that we do with flight school is one, we teach them how to jump higher, and some of that is basic coaching and cueing in terms of how you jump, how you land, things like that. The other is looking at the determinants of vertical jump power. So every time you jump, we can say, you know, there's certain factors that change that affect the way you go in the air. So, actually, you guys want to guess some of them? So feel free to be forward here, put your arm up. Guess what are some of the determinants of vertical jump power? So if I said what will make Brett jump high? Um, flexibility in the hip flexor. Okay, flexibility. So we, we're going to call that mobility, because that will be more about the joints and how will they move. Um, just the power coming from, like, off the ground. Like, uh, like, okay. Like, the pressure <laughs> yeah. into the ground, like, it's going up. So how you develop force. Yes. So we're, we're going to break that into a few different categories, and we're going to kind of say, where does that force come from? That kind of goes along with force. The more force you get, the more speed you get. There. So arm swing is a very big one. The use of arm swing is a very big factor in jumping. How much of that you Yes and no. That'll kind of go along with the coaching. I'm looking for something slightly different. It's kind of like use of arms. Method? Mm, you do use it, but that's not one of the factors. So I'll start giving them to you. So there's leg power. So we have different muscles in our legs, right, that we want to actually use to drive in the ground. So you were right when you said how much force you put in the ground, but we want to say from your leg. Then there's hip and back power. So when, when you bend over, you're extending at the waist, so you have to have strength there. There's arm swing. And then when we talked about the coaching part of it, there's coordination and timing. So you may be all over the map with your arms, you may be all over the map in your nervous system in terms of when muscles are turning on and when they should turn on. 
this mobility and whether you have any previous injuries because that will affect how well you jump. So those are some of the determinants of vertical jump out. So we can break that apart and be able to look at each one of you and say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, where we might need to work on. So how do we train that? So how do we train the ability to jump higher, to be faster, be stronger? So if we look back at the guy here, who's, you know, got his belly button over the net, how do we all become like that? So I want some of your suggestions right now. How do we jump higher? Biometrics, that's a good one. Anything else? Strength. Strength training is also good. Yeah, so mobility and flexibility work, making sure that all of your muscles are both elastic and you can move in right ranges of motion. So we can also do speed work, right? Even though you guys don't run a lot, sprinting will make your whole body faster, move faster, and more explosive. So I'm sure if you took Usain Bolt and you asked him to jump, he wouldn't just get off the ground a couple inches. But even though he's a sprinter, he'd be extremely explosive and his spurt would be very high. So, we've got plyometrics, we have speed work, we have strength work, we have mobility and flexibility work. So we might as well just do all of it, right? If it all helps. But then, right, if we do too much, boom, right? <laughs> we can have an injury, right? You never know, if you're just training on, on training, on training, on training, on training, sooner or later you're gonna break down. And this is a pretty good slide to show what might happen in your knee, or your hip, or your ankle, or your back. Um, so all this exposure to training can easily lead you to an injury. So now Tom's going to talk a little bit about that side of the story. Uh, just uh, quick air kind of feels a little bit of pain in their knees. Kind of pretty uh, really alarming. We do this all every single time. Any low back problems? Okay. So what are some of the type of knee problems that you guys have? Like who has like jumper's knee? Ever been diagnosed with jumper's knee? Like patella femoral type of problems, shin problems. So coaches and everyone here, this is why we're here. It's really this alarming reality. Participating in sports has real material risk. This is really represents this, you know, this beautiful, you know, tree, this developing, you know, athlete with potential that suddenly gets ridden by a whole bunch of different type of injuries. Some of them could be an ACL, an Achilles rupture, jumper's knee pathology, so many different places. So what, what happens here, this is um, an acute ACL injury, probably within about you know 40, within about 24 hours. Right? Who here has seen an ACL? Happened before them? Okay. Anyone have an ACL injury? Okay. okay. So, this is a really important concept to start explaining some things. So we have injuries, and everyone's kind of complaining that raised their hands about some of the symptoms, but we also have to have, have an appreciation for signs. So have an appreciation that, okay, what are injuries exactly? What are symptoms, and what are the signs? So a symptom is something that you guys feel. So as soon as something, so as soon as you kind of feel something in your knees, something in your low back, that represents a symptom. A sign is something that someone outside your body can see. Does that make sense a little bit? I uh, hope it, we'll kind of go over that. We'll touch base on the difference, and it's a very important difference between understanding symptoms versus signs. But before we get into that, we're gonna talk about injuries, which really represent, for the most part, exposures to loads, right, that exceed tissue tolerance and recovery. And you don't have to worry about writing this. We're gonna give you guys like all the slides and everything else. Uh, we put up um, uh, all this type of stuff on our website, and so we'll, we'll share that link with you guys. The whole PowerPoint's up there. We have a whole bunch of other type of uh, uh, resources there as well. Um, and this represents kind of like a, a biomechanical way of looking at um, how tissues respond to the loads that um, are placed on them. So if I were to take a look at, like imagine if I had a piece of steel in my hands, which is kind of like a rubber cord. The material properties are very, very different. Right? And this represents a stress training curve. So stress represents the amount of force I'll be putting onto a particular material. 
strain represents how much it would deform. So if I took this and if I tried to bend it, right, it could take a whole lot more force than this rubber port. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> you can say yes. So, <laughs> so if I put a given amount of force into it, eventually I'll get to a point where it can't return back to its original shape. Okay. At that point, it gets permanently deformed. Okay. And then if you continue to do that, if I continue to leverage this and keep on pulling, eventually this will break. So we start thinking about our bodies within that similar kind of idea. If we load it, not a big deal, right? But if we continue to load it, load it, and with enough magnitude, eventually we can get to the ultimate yield train. And that's usually when a rupture happens. But if I take small little loads, and if I have it over a whole long to long period, eventually I'll start breaking down, and I'll start lowering my threshold. And then that's when symptoms start happening. So I want to make this a little bit more clear, hopefully with this diagram, where we talk about signs, which are things that we can see, like outside, or things that we would kind of see if I was to take like a, a, like a biopsy, or if I was to kind of take like a section of tissue and kind of assess that, if I was to kind of use a microscope and actually take a look. Are there signs of wear, signs of damage before there are symptoms? And symptoms, again, are things that you guys feel. So usually people think like this. I get a symptom right here, and what would you do? If you had a knee problem, what would you do? I said, trash. trash. Hopefully maybe like see someone for it, right? Kind of get evaluated, right? But usually it's kind of like a, a knee-jerk reaction. You feel something, and kind of don't really pay attention for a little, you kind of hope that it goes away. But hopefully you, you do this. Hopefully you, you feel a symptom, and then you would rehab this, right? But should, so, should a sign, should, should we be able to tell that you're on the route for an injury? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? Okay. What are some of those signs, like things that would, would let you know an injury is about to happen? Like if you don't have the right instruments in your squad, you're going to go in. Beautiful. That's awesome. Anyone else? When you're hitting, like if your arms swimming, if you're swimming, if you're not swimming properly, and you're doing the motion over and over again, you can like overuse certain muscles. Beautiful. That's a really, really beautiful one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we got these signs, right, that we can see. If you were to take a look and you were to video everyone in this room, right, there are probably certain type of signs that might make you think, hmm. I, I kind of don't like that. I don't know if it's going to become a problem, but we probably want to fix this because we want to deal with a sign that it might become a problem during this asymptomatic period. So we did a study with over 3,000 different athletes, and over 90% of those athletes displayed this inward movement of the knee. It's called dynamic valgus. For a volleyball player, it happens after a particular skill, so after you spike when you land, the knee comes in pretty dramatically. It also happens very commonly during takeoff. So for coaches that are kind of looking at this, you'll almost see that this, like many athletes will come, and then the knees will come inwards. And it's not to say that that's going to lead to a problem, but studies have shown with ACLs that dynamic knee valgus is a predisposing factor for um, ACL ruptures. So hopefully you can just remember this, is that yeah, there's a whole bunch of signs before we have a problem. Another way to look at this, sorry, this is kind of, so realistically, if you were to look at this, you almost think, when did the injury begin? Did it really begin when I just started to feel, feel symptoms? Or did it really begin way back over here when I wasn't moving very well? During this asymptomatic period. Something to think about, because an injury doesn't necessarily mean with symptoms. An injury can almost be thought of as a dysfunction with signs. And this is another way of looking at it. So this is the amount of uh, tissue change. This is time. Red line represents symptoms. See, symptoms don't kind of just stay. They kind of <coughs> go, they get better, they get worse. They get better, they get worse. They get better, and they get worse. 
This represents the tissue quality, this green line here. So symptoms, tissue qualities, and if the red line gets high enough, then we start feeling symptoms. And if the, the dysfunction gets high enough, then they'll become an injury. So in this case here, at the beginning, we really kind of are sub-symptoms. We don't really feel anything. This is in that period between the sign and the symptom. But eventually, if it gets high enough, we accumulate a whole bunch of load. And eventually, it gets to a place where we finally see a sign of the symptom. But in that period, we'll note that the tissue quality is just starting to break down. So that becomes a very important sign. You may see um, swelling without symptoms. Right? You may find that you can't jump quite as high right? because something's just kind of bothering you just a little bit. So that's another sign. Eventually, you'll get to a place where your tissues will start dramatically breaking down and your symptoms will dramatically become much more severe to a place where it becomes chronic. You can't do anything about it. So usually what happens is, during a breakdown period, people's symptoms really creep up, and then they go through a period of rehab, they stop, they think it feels a whole lot better, but then what happens is they haven't dealt with building that tissue up. So that happens with a lot of physio, even chiro, a lot of care, is it only treats the site of injury. It treats the pain. It doesn't necessarily build on the qualities of the tissue itself. So let's say, for example, if I'm doing repeated jump, jump, jumps, and I get jumper's knee, I'm starting to experience a little bit of um, tendon breakdown. What would you guys think repairs and builds that tendon? There's only one thing in the whole entire world that we know to actually increase tendon strength properties. Hamstring strength? Okay, so that's really important because many people with jumpers, they, they have a little too much anterior translation, so their knee comes forward <coughs> too much, and it places too much strain on that tendon, right? But I'm looking for something specific that actually helps build that tendon strength, the patellar tendon. Maybe squat. Beautiful. Strength is the only thing, hot, heavy resistance training is the only thing that's going to actually create a cellular response such that you actually increase more collagen or, or more tendon, right? It's not gonna be IFC, it's not gonna be laser, it's not gonna be someone massaging that area, giving soft tissue stuff. The only thing that creates a cellular, a biochemical, sorry, a biological response is the heavy load that happens with trend training. So, if I was to take, here's a nice little video, and I just want you to kind of think, is this athlete prepared? Are these athletes prepared? Like what are they prepared for? This is what you'll see all the time. That's a senior national team basketball athlete. Qualified for the Olympics. Yeah, she just qualified for the Olympics. Right, like look how much inward movement of the knee there is. And the big question is, really, what are they prepared for? So we've seen this. 90% of the athletes demonstrate this in half the minute. Okay? So, and we've seen that better athletes move better. And that the great thing is that this is totally correctable. So if I was moving this way, okay, I'm, th this kind of represents uh, the amount of exposure or load exposures that we would have. Okay? And these are the two factors that determine what type of load exposure we have. So there's motor control and temporal, which is time. So motor control represents the, an athlete's awareness, their physical literacy to kind of control this particular position. So of all those athletes that we tested, 90% of them, how many, how many of them do you think realized that their knee was moving in? It's pretty frightening, like none. Right, because why would you actually want to move in something so blatantly wrong, so glaringly inappropriate? None of them actually knew that they were actually moving this way. Right? The cool thing is that if you start making them aware, then they can actually have a way that they can actually begin to control this. And that represents the concept of physical literacy or system stability. 
Other things that impact motor control, what, how well we control that position in addition to awareness and control, is fatigue. So if we're in a fatigued state, we don't nearly have as much motor control. So if we go on a run, the beginning portion of our run, our feet sound crisp, solid. But towards the end, you might start having a little bit of slappage, start getting a little bit more heavier than at the beginning. So that represents a decrease in motor control and influence of fatigue. Temporal factors that influence how much load exposure you have are the number of games you have per week, the number of practices, the number of tournaments. You also see that overzealous parents can influence this, coaches and the system all have a way of impacting how much exposure you have. So in that video, when you're seeing the young athletes jumping up and down, all, right, and it doesn't look ideal, how many reps can they really have? How many practices can they really have before it becomes a problem? See, that's that asym asymptomatic period. You've seen the sign. The sign is that inward movement of the knee, right? Then we're exposing it to all these different types of forces repeatedly over and over again through games, practice, and tournaments. They're motor control. They don't have awareness. They don't have control quite yet. And it's just a ticking time bomb. So that's really how injuries really kind of root themselves. It's not, it's not as if because you're, you're feeling okay that you know, you're know you asymptomatic, there's no problems. That's kind of like the opportunity to say, wow, look, I see something that we need to correct. And so much better to correct it during that asymptomatic period. And this represents why we feel movement is, is central too. Um, and if they're all a whole bunch of different movements. They're like basic low level movements when we're just using our body weight. Then there's high level movements which represents what we do in sport. So in this case here, all these movements and all of our tests represents just your system weight, just your body weight. So if I ask the person just like standing on one leg to squat down as low as you can and come, back, and come right back up, no problem, you can do that repeatedly. That's just my body weight on a single leg. What happens if I hop, if I jump? What happens during competition? Instead of just my body weight, I'm gonna expo get exposed to four, five, even up to eight times my body weight in a single moment. So movement central to injury prevention, injury management, and athletic performance. And we kind of covered this a little bit, but what are the other things that affect how well we move? Everyone starts, you say posture, everyone straightens up. Kind of nice. But posture has a huge impact on how we move. If you sit really poorly, you know, for many, many hours, guess what happens to your ability to move? You get up from that, you're stiffer and tight. Like we had that comment about hip flexors before, earlier in the day. You know, sitting is the number one type of posture to, you know, reduce our hip flexibility. Output represents our power, our ability to generate force. And capacity represents um, how well we're able to repeat that movement. Because in some cases, if you get fatigued and tired, no matter how powerful and strong you are, you're not going to be able to replicate that movement because you're too tired, you're going to compensate. Now, the key thing is, we're in this continuum of being able to properly do basic movements to sport movements, do we see a dysfunction? Do we see an athlete break down? So, if I were to squat like this, Okay, I'm good with this. I'm good bending down to maybe a quarter squat position, but I might not be able to go down to like a parallel squat position. I definitely might not be able to handle what it would do in a jump because those loads incrementally get bigger and bigger. So we want to be able to find out when a person breaks down. Uh, this here is what's up, uh, Man Paredes, and there's Victoria. And we've seen this really cool story. So uh, Melissa's story is where she was a libero. She played libero all the way through club. 
then went to York University, played her first year there as libero as well, and then she decided to hit, right, and go into a power position. We, ha we were starting to work with a whole bunch of beach athletes, and some of these beach athletes, after a couple of years, they really changed dramatically. So normally you should be able to have full horizontal flexion all the way up to the top, be able to touch your hand, and also flexion this way. So this is abduction, this is flexion here. But what started to happen was, when we started testing beach volleyball athletes or volleyball athletes with the long history of hitting, they don't have that ability anymore. They actually start getting up kind of being in this type of position here. It was really, really dramatic. And this is actually what we saw happening with Melissa. So in through here, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, compensatory uh, kind of compensations that happen when you actually can't reach straight up above you and make contact here. Right? What, what, would, what can you see here as a compensation? Because she's not fully extended in that picture. Really common. We see that all over the place. So you can see how arched she is. So who here has low back problems? Who here has low back problems and shoulder problems? So it can come in different ways. So usually at the beginning, sometimes people's shoulder problems means that they'll start incorporating an over arch position because they can actually get into this position here. So because they can't get into this position, they'll compensate and then they'll arch back. Because if I'm here, say this is as far as I can raise my shoulder upwards, then what I'll do is then I'll, I'll arch just so I can bring my hand to what seems to be overhead. So you can see how she is hitting out of front of her body. In this position here, we're seeing early signs of a change. So she's right-handed. You can see the differences, a subtle difference between that position. You guys can see that, yeah? Right, so that little subtle difference is kind of like the sign of other things that are kind of happening. So she's really symptomatic in this phase here, but we know that there's a sign of something coming. So we have to make sure that we restore this. And this is one of our things that she always kind of checks to make sure that, well, do I actually feel a back portion of my forearm up against this platform here? So she'll do this. And then you can see Victoria, she can't even do a hip flexor stretch without overarching in her low back. She doesn't have enough control of her core to actually keep this position within neutral. So it's no wonder that she starts, everything that she does, she starts going into an arch-based position. So again, it's the amount of load exposure that she has in that position that aggravates her. People with jumpers knee, it's all tied to how your mechanics, your, ten, uh, your tendon properties, your knee control, and how much exposure you have to jumping, more than likely with non-ideal movement patterns. Um, but probably enough about, um, about the injury side, and we'll try to bring you guys back. So we're kind of talking about injuries, and now we're talking about the sexier kind of thing, like performance. And so these are like two really important things that we've learned since we've been around for about five years about um, some you know, performance secrets. And so it's called the no yo-yo effect and doing basic well. So this data is over three year periods and it looks at Alpine ski racers and it looks at the difference, the only difference between these two groups is one group trains during their competitive season, the other group stops. So the group, both of them trained 30 weeks a year. So you can see that in year one, both the, the white and the orange line are, are identical. But then there's a separation. And the separation amounts to a difference of 28 inch vert versus 35 inch vert over three year periods. There's nothing that at the onset you would ever think that would distinguish them. Nothing. Like you would look at them and say, wow, they're both identical, they're skiing just the same. The other difference was the 35 group just trained year round. So a small little thing represents the yo-yo. The white represents they built up, then they stopped, they went down. They built up, stopped during the competitive season, went back down. They built back up and stopped. The crazy thing is, after the first year of training, it was equal to 
there last year. So they actually did have any improvement over the three years beyond that first training block. So this line here represents the same line as over here. And that's what really, really pissed me off with that whole group is because, yeah, you want them to get better. You want them to have this opportunity to succeed. But because of their training habits, they dip down remarkably. And that represents a 450% difference in the two groups and how much they improve. And if we think about it like this, and this is really important for this group here, if you guys really want to jump high, even higher, you can almost expect like a two, two inches. We really kind of go conservative here. We have some remarkable results with some of our female athletes and what they've been able to jump. Um, to about four, uh, four inches for guys per year. So if you think that you kind of start off at a 20 inch bird, and over a six year period, so we usually like to think about them as before they go off to college, then what happens during college, it kind of represents a 28 plus inch bird over that period. So, and it's just like this sm small, modest type of improvement and small, modest gain. For the guys, it can be even a little bit more dramatic. And um, this is uh, the story that I told this guy here. Before we went to St. Bonaventure, we actually sat him down and we said, okay, you got four years to truly develop yourself, right? And next thing you know, it becomes uh, a first round pick. This is something that we love to do consistently. And on the female side with their birds, you know, Melissa, when she first came to us, she had a 21 inch bird, you know, she went to 28.7. Like Heather Vance came, uh, came to us and she had a 22 and a half inch bird. She finished off the 28, eight, I think. Right? Um, and that was with six months. So these numbers are very conservative. This isn't something that's about knowing and have everyone in this group can have that type of response. Uh, doing basic well is just really making sure that you avoid the signs, making sure you, 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 you kind of correct those signs, move properly. And now we're actually gonna go over some real injury prevention strategies and tie everything together from an athletic development perspective and an injury prevention perspective. Really speaking about jumpers knee. So if you guys have a little bit of jumpers knee or a little bit of pain in the knees, you should really uh, pay attention to this because it might be helpful for you. Okay, so this first slide is really, really important. This kind of tells, really tells the whole story of jumpers knee and kind of what happens in your tendon um, when you're moving around. So we already talked about the characteristics up here, right? We have chemical factors and we have those control factors. So those are, those go back to kind of our physical literacy, how well we move, how well we do things. Temporal factors, right, are again, how many exposures do we have? How often are we training? How are we recovering? So that's not black and white all the time because if you move really, really well, maybe you can handle a little bit more sort of exposure without it breaking down. If you move horrendously, and if you're, you know, one of these videos that's extremely, <coughs> extremely bad in terms of like valgus or all these different signs, right, the signs we talked about, then the amount of exposures you can handle might be a lot lower, right? If, if your signs are very alarming, it might only take, you know, one season before we see a breakdown. So those are kind of those are two factors that they're always working together and they, they kind of change as you change. In terms of the tendon, um, we have, every time we do something, right, we're gonna have an effect. We're gonna have adaptation in the tendon. And Thomas already spoke about um, sort of putting stress on it and helping improve the tendon with strength training. So if we jump and we have a practice, we have a game, basically if we have any type of exposure, we're gonna come down to this. So this is a normal tendon. Now we have reactive tendonopathy. That just means that it's changing. So right away, something happens, you jump, you did a practice, you did a tournament game, a whole bunch of strength training. Doesn't necessarily matter what it is. It is reactive, so that means just means that sort of the actual tendon itself goes under change. It has load and it decides to sort of shift and it says, I'm gonna get stronger, I'm gonna do this. But if you rest, and again, there's factors in here about sort of nutrition, hydration, um, 
whenever you're sleeping, how much time you're taking up. So if you take care of those temporal factors, then all of a sudden it will build stronger and you'll come up. Right? You'll have a positive adaptation, stronger tendon, and you'll kind of stay in the short loop. If you don't, then all of a sudden you come down into something that's called tendon disrepair. So now all of a sudden the tendon starts breaking down. The tissue actually changes properties so that it can no longer handle the same amount of load. So now you've kind of put yourself in a position where um, you're symptomatic. You can feel soreness in there, it aches, but you can still run and jump on it. Um, and so you should take care of it, but you may not be. If you do, there's a chance that you can still reverse it. So you take some time off to just train, take care of your movement, all these sort of factors that we said that will help. And then all of a sudden you kind of make recovery back and you get back to the top of it. If you don't, you keep playing, you don't rest, you don't eat well, all these things happen, then you come right down to degenerative tendinopathy. And that's basically the point of no return. You notice there's no arrow going back up again. That's the real chronic jumper's knee where, you know, there's really no escape anymore. It's broken down to a point where it can't just re-strengthen itself back to a regular, fully functioning tendon. It means every time you play, you're going to have pain. It means you might not be able to walk up the stairs without hurting yourself. So this is kind of a, a great summary of exactly how the body works and how you can't avoid this part, right? This will always happen anytime you put load under it. But as long as it's managed properly, then it, we get into this loop where we're getting stronger. We have a healthy tendon, we can keep playing, everything's great. If you don't manage it, then we start cascading down. So this next slide is a picture of the tendon under a microscope. So now you can see how they actually change. So if this is a healthy tendon, and those are all the new things, yeah, so, you don't have to yeah. so, so no, there's beautiful striations within a normal tendon, just like a cloth. You can see the, the fiber orientation. And if you look here, look how many dots there are. Those are tendon sites. Those are the cells within them. Now, what do you guys see here? Think about mold. What do you see here? Tons of them all over the place. This is, this is the analogy that I love to use is, it's a happy baby, right? So happy baby, right? You can rock it. It's really, you know, it's the best thing to be around. But if it's hungry or it has something, a problem down below, <laughs> right? Then all of a sudden it starts acting up and starts getting really, really violent. And next thing you know, uh, everyone's getting around kids. That's what happens. <laughs> it's the truth. And so what happens is those cells change. Right, so if you were to look at the ones that are experiencing tendon pain right now, this is probably what happens. The tendon cells themselves have actually changed. They go through proliferation. They change, and they change in shape. So all of a sudden, you have all of this. How quickly can this happen? Almost instantaneously. I know, it's pretty crazy. And what happens when this gets into this type of state it starts secreting these things called proteoglycans, which over a prolonged period of time, it takes a long time, all of a sudden it looks like this. So if there's normal striated patterns like this, and they're completely destroyed. Look at this. And so this is kind of like the, this is like the, the public service thing that's on, uh, on cigarette boxes, telling you not to smoke, about how disgusting your lungs can be. This is the equivalent for an athlete speaking about jumpers knee. So that's how disgusting jumpers knees really looks like if you don't manage it very well. So it goes through that healthy stage all the way over into a degenerative stage. And we've had a couple really important cases where um, one group of alpine skiers, uh, four of the five of them developed degenerative tendinopathy. Uh, one of them actually had it had to it actually start dying, and he hasn't been able to see. Um, hasn't been able to see since. You have to have it surgically removed, that portion of the tendon that actually died out. The other one that we had um, won bronze medal at World Juniors. He's on the senior men's national team right now, and he's definitely going to be there for the Olympics in Sochi. 
If you picture this as like the pillars in a building, when the tendon's healthy and it's all kind of aligned the right way, right, the structure will bear the entire load of the building. Everything's fine. Basically, like structural integrity. When you get to the last one and it's all disorganized like that, you don't have the same integrity in terms of withstanding load. And that's where you get basically that destruction of the tendon. Okay, so we, we talked a little bit about this before, and these are the temporal factors. So anytime that you're playing games, practice, and tournaments, right, this can really affect how much um, how much load is on that tendon, right? A game may not be a big deal, but a game inside a tournament can be if you play three games one day, three games the next day, maybe it's a three-day tournament, so you do another three games. Now all of a sudden, you said, okay, one game, not so bad, but if you're multiplying that by nine, you know, like three days, then all of a sudden you might be getting to a point where, you know, you're creeping, cascading down that, that slide. And so, we always have to say, sometimes when we get athletes that are kind of at this, this bridge where he's talking about where it gets, you know, to that point where you can either take the, the right road and get better or the wrong road and potentially have some chronic injuries for your career. Sometimes we have to say, look, you're going to have to stop practicing once a week or, you know, you have to, you know, quit that team and only play on this team or, you know, all these things. We can't physically make that choice. We call the coach and say, cut this player. But we can say, we strongly recommend you don't play. Um, maybe you made an all-star team and there's a tour where you're playing 10 games in a week, you know, in South America. Anyway, it might be a position where you can be like, wow, it was such an honor to get picked for this team. I can go play. But if your knee is at that point where it needs rest, then that could be the one thing that kind of puts you over the top and puts you in a position where it now it's going to take years to get better instead of days or weeks. Bio biomechanical and neuromuscular control factors. So those are the ones that we can control. Um, sorry, you guys can control individually and, and that we help you control. So physical literacy, that's basically a term that we use to say, how well do you know your body? How well can you move it? Um, can you kind of, can it do what you want it to do all the time? We talked about valgus and how some of those kids didn't know what was happening, right? If we say, I don't want you to let that knee cave in, and we do a whole bunch of exercises, how well can you pay attention that whole time and say, I'm not going to let it happen, and make sure it doesn't, right? So physical literacy is kind of um, a, a general term about how well you can control your body and have it do what you want, or not do what you want, what you want to not do. So there's awareness, there's control, there's strength. So we'll, when I was talking about hamstring strength, sometimes for proper knee control, that's something you need. So maybe you know your knee's going forward, but you can't do anything about it because your hamstring's not strong enough yet. So you have to go back, strengthen your hamstring so that you can come, come back and say, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna let you move anymore, knee. You're gonna stay right there. Ankle and foot control and mobility. So this is something that um, I find in basketball and volleyball can sometimes be a big issue because you guys also, because of the risk of ankle injuries, a lot of braces, right? Some of you will wear braces all the time as a protective mechanism. Some of you will only wear it whenever you kind of roll your ankle or sprain it. Um, but unfortunately, braces can sometimes very limit the amount of movement you have. So if you're used to wearing it all the time, can kind of lose control of how to actually move your foot around and your ankle around. There's a lot of muscles in your feet that you want that to, to stabilize you and to help you move that sometimes kind of just, I don't want to say go to sleep, but you lose the ability to control them. If you haven't had an ankle injury and you wear ankle braces, would you then recommend that you shouldn't? Just because you're losing the ability? Well, I don't necessarily recommend that you don't when you play, but say if you're going to spend, say, certain amount of time practicing, a certain amount of time playing, a certain amount of time training, you need to be able to spend a certain amount of time out of it. So if you can kind of practice a lot of ankle and foot control when you're training, maybe do a practice a week, or even just your warm-ups or things like that where you're not wearing them, and kind of keep the control, then there's nothing wrong with going to a game and putting them on to make sure you don't spray it. So it doesn't mean that you never have to wear ankle braces, but it means don't spend all of your time in them because then you're not going to be able to get that control back. 
So then we have system stability, which is spine and pelvis control. Um, you're, you're, we were talking about your core and with Victoria and Mel and about losing that back position, hip position. We want to be able to say, no matter where we're moving, whether it's from our arms, legs, anything like that, we need to be able to control it and keep it in the right place. We don't want to overuse our back all the time when we're doing stretches, when we're hitting, jumping, lifting. So you need to be able to control that. If you can't, then that's going to be one of those signs that's going to lead possibly lead to an injury. If you can, then obviously that's going to put you in the good side of it. And then we have force absorption and jumping ability. So a lot of you jump on a regular basis, every practice, every game, but you don't necessarily all land the same way. Um, sometimes you go over landing mechanics, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just forget them or you're fatigued and you don't practice them properly. Well, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of force that you take on every time you land. You think about the momentum you get from being up in the air. And the better you are jumping, the higher you're going to get, the more force comes down. If you're getting tired or, or sort of um, you're just not focused, or you've never actually been shown, then you might be landing in a way that's putting you know, a lot of stress on your, on your patellar tendon or any other tissues in your MCL or your meniscus. So learning how to absorb force and learning how to land properly is also a big factor in terms of um, keeping yourself pain free. So here's a really cool timeline um, of a whole bunch of athletes, different sports, doesn't really matter. So we're going to start actually going backwards. Here's a pro, and this guy, do you guys know the name? It's Mary Lemieux. Mary Lemieux was one of the best hockey players to ever play. And, but he had his, his career cut short because he had severe back injuries. So that was that picture we had before, right? The stress on this <coughs> sorry, the stress on his tissues and the symptoms now became way more than his tissues could handle. So his tissues could no longer handle the stress, so he basically was in so much pain he couldn't play hockey anymore. But is that is that a cause of him at the NHL level doing something wrong? Was he taking too many hits? Was he doing something wrong when he was skating? Or maybe it happened back in his college and university. <coughs> maybe it was all the exposures he had there. For him, it might have been the OHL or the QMJHL. <coughs> when you're dealing with some symptoms and you're dealing with pain, but you never really properly manage it, maybe you throw ice on every once in a while you sit down, but you never actually take care of the cause. Or maybe it started uh, maybe it started when he was a teenager and he was playing club, right? And this is the point where you may be symptomatic, you may be not. It might be showing up sometimes. Your knee hurts, your hip hurts, your ankle hurts, your foot hurts, your back hurts, and sometimes you're fine, right? You play the whole weekend, you don't feel anything. Or maybe it came all the way back to how he moved when he was a kid, right? This, these are the signs we talked about where it starts, but you don't necessarily feel it. So the kid may not be saying, oh, I'm concerned because every time I run, I have valgus, right? <laughs> Kids just have to find he's playing. He's exhibiting signs, but he doesn't feel any pain. So this is the kind of pattern that even though we see the end result, we see many of the that can't play anymore, and we say, oh, is it the NHL? Are they practicing too much? Are they hitting too hard? Just because he shouldn't play a contact sport. Or was it something that you could have prevented when he was a kid, right? These things cascade as we go through these exposures. And it's not just about a week. It's about, you know, you guys going off to college and university and spending four years playing, right? It only becomes more intense as you play. playing. So this is how we make better athletes. We say, let's prevent this injury and train to jump higher, be faster, be stronger at the same time. So we mix kind of knee pain to tend off the injury prevention with flight school, right? That was our original idea of how to make athletes jump high. So when we're preventing it, we want to create total, complete knee control. So is your hamstring strong enough, right, so that it can, you know, prevent anterior translation of the knee? Are your hips or feet strong enough to keep your knee from going in or out? Right? We want to be able to have you do a whole bunch of exercises, and I want to say, don't let that knee move, and then you, you prevent that. So if you can hold that the whole time, and we can increase the load and increase the intensity, 
and can keep folding it, then we know you're doing a really good job with that sort of biomechanical factor preventing injury. So then there's flexibility and mobility. Can you get in a certain position? If you can't sort of bend when you land, you can't really absorb force over a full range, you can't absorb it through your muscles, and you might put extra stress on your joint. So mobility in all of your joints makes a big difference. Appropriate practice, game and training exposure. So that's what we talked about, you know, potentially someday having to say, hold up, maybe I shouldn't play twice a day, five days a week, 12 months a year, and think, oh, I'll be fine. So maybe sometimes you have to make a sacrifice and say, oh, I'm not gonna go to that tournament, or I'm not gonna play for that team, or I'm gonna take a week off of practice, or something like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be something super dramatic and say, I have to take a year on volleyball, oh no. Sometimes it's just a little thing, just saying like, oh, I usually do this optional kind of practice here where I go and hit with my friends or do whatever. Maybe I should just chill. Maybe I should just not do that this week. Teaching jumping, landing again. So that's when the force is in the highest, when you're taking off and when you're landing. So that's when we want to make sure that, one, you're doing it properly, and two, um, so you have that control during it, but you also have strength and capacity to be able to absorb. And finally, system stability. So that was, again, sort of our trunk, our spine, and pelvic area. Can we control that through all of our movement? Now for the training side of it. So we talked before about the determinants of vertical jump power. We have motor control and timing. So that has to do with um, both the muscles turning on. So that's why I said sometimes speed training can really help you jump higher. And it's not necessarily because you're gonna run, but it could be just about potentiating your system to move quicker, right? If you tell your muscles to fire extremely fast and when you ask it to jump, they'll do the same thing. Sometimes it's the timing of you know, your arms and legs working together when you jump. Sometimes those are way off and it can really keep you from getting in the air. So when we talked about all the increases in vertical jump height that we have with different athletes, some parts of it are literally reteaching them how to jump before we even change the physiology. So sometimes it's just, wow, you have no idea how to jump and that's keeping you on the floor. We have leg power and that's when squats and different exercises like that come in. Actually building the horsepower. We have back and hip extension power. Again, more muscles, just different muscles. And all very this up to notice that. And we have integrated arm swing. And finally, system stability, no leaks. When we mean leaks, we mean if you're trying to jump, and right, and maybe your back kind of collapses and you jump, there's a whole lot of energy that was kind of traveling through your body from the ground up that now is going to fall out because certain things are moving in ways you didn't want to. So that's why system stability is really important. So what are the take home points? So we have, our, our tissues have tolerance and we, even though we don't always feel hurt, doesn't mean that we're not approaching a point of kind of no return. So we always have to be mindful that we don't want to let the stress overtake the actual tolerance of the tissue. So we always have to mediate the stress that we put on our body. M3, so the M cubed was movement is central to prevention of injuries, management of injuries, and athletic performance. So reteaching the way we move can really both help you, you know, prevent jumpers knee and jump high. So even though we put them on two sides of the coin, they really aren't fitting together. And then finally, you can train to jump higher and be stronger at the same time as preventing injury. Um, should I keep going? I skipped the last one. Yeah? Should I keep going or skip the last one? All right, so then, two left. We have temporal factors and motor control factors. So, Whenever we're talking about injury on your tissues, right, we always have to balance out how much exposure you're putting on them and how much control you have. And with the arrows, we can see that they, like I said before, they affect each other. If you have great motor control and you have strong tissues and you've been training and you're in a sort of, to talk about balance, and you have all those factors that we talked about, then you can withstand a certain amount of load. You should still never overdo it, but if your motor control is is sort of subpar, then that will really reduce the amount of load that you can put on your system. And finally, the last one, 
is the no yo-yo. So remember, it's more about a consistent approach to kind of teaching these these habits, this motor control, this leg power, all of these things in order to get where you want. You want those games to get on the senior national team, like I mentioned with the Australian volleyball players. They trained over years to go up three, four, or five inches in their jumps, but they I guarantee you they didn't take a couple months off at a time. Otherwise, those were the ones that didn't make it. So you want to keep your games and you want to keep moving forward. You have to remember it's not about a six-week camp, right? It's not these six-week camps to learn how to be a better athlete and then go home. It's about a regular sort of commitment to being better every day throughout the whole year, even during the competitive season. So, Thompson, I would like to say thank you very much.